me just uh, announce one quick change that we've had to the panel. Unfortunately, Murat, who is the founder of Marvel, a prototyping app, was unable to get here uh, due to his flight being canceled. So we had a last minute update. Uh, my friend Mike Davidson, thanks for joining us. Mike is the vice president of design at Twitter. Um, and I think it's going to make a fine substitution. So thank you again thank for you. doing that. Um, great. Let me set a little more context uh, based on what Scott was saying. Um, we're talking, first of all, the title of the, of the panel here, Design is the New Engineering. Um, I don't think we're talking about craft, the craft of design replacing the craft of engineering. In fact, as we saw this morning, that's getting more and more blurred. But it is really about the focus, this idea, this almost mythology from Silicon Valley of, of two engineers in a garage uh, creating the next products is much more an engineer and a designer, or a designer and a business person, or a designer even alone. Um, from that foundation, let me add some statistics that have been going on. In the last five years, uh, 27 companies with a design co-founder have been acquired by a tech company. Uh, in the last five years, 15 design agencies have been acquired and integrated into product companies, something that never happened in the past. Design agencies were only ever acquired by larger design agencies. So that's a big shift. And uh, from a more personal perspective, um, uh, in the last 18 months, six different venture capital firms in the San Francisco Bay Area added designers as partners. And that's something that happened in my career. I'm now a partner at True Ventures. So I would like to talk to this panel about uh, this sort of this full stack design that Scott was talking about. There's design tools uh, that not only, I think, are changing the way that people like all of you are making products, uh, but also democratizing creativity uh, and expression. Things like Pinterest and Instagram are ways of people visually representing their own themselves who may never have been designers. There's designers as founders, which we have one here on Sage, using user experience as a way of differentiating. I think Typeform is a great example of that, so we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then design in the DNA of companies. Um, and let's start there. So, uh, Neil, I'd love for, uh, your perspective on this. You have nearly 20 years of investing experience. You started Index Ventures, one of the most successful European-based um, uh, venture capital firms. Uh, I think there's this hy hypothesis here around uh, uh, designers as founders, uh, user experience in a company as a way of sort of mitigating the risk in what is increasingly crowded spaces um, of, of making sure that these are products that are actually going to be more successful because of consideration of user experience. Have you seen that? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I should, I should preface this by saying I'm the only person here who's not a designer, so <laughs> I'm kind of an imposter in this room. Um, but from my naive standpoint, uh, you know, I think that we look at design as a, uh, a kind of uh, surrogate marker for, um, you know, just sense of product in a company. Um, one thing I've learned over the years is that uh, if a company doesn't have a strong product sense, a design sense in their DNA, it's very hard to retrofit that to a business. Um, we've, we've tried. Um, and we've, we've, we've never really seen that happen. It's got to be part of the original uh, team, I believe, and it's got to be part of the founding vision for the company. Um, uh, and today it's really, you know, I mean, you talk about a design-first approach to solving a problem. So we look at that as... Uh, uh, one of the indicators in deciding whether or not we want to invest in something, and we're looking for a, uh, an indication that the company um, has thought deeply about how to connect a user uh, with a solution um, and how that's going to look, how that's going to feel, how that's going to flow. So, yeah, it's very important. So criterion for us. there's this great story from uh, Brian and Joe, uh, Airbnb, um, as they went around sort of uh, to VC after VC after VC, they get turned down over and over again. Um, and not just for the idea of Airbnb, but uh, what are three designers from RISD going to, you're not going to be able to start a company. Like that perception, it seems, um, Airbnb, Pinterest, we have all of these examples now of that happening. Um, is that just now more of a, like a bias has lifted across the investment community? <clears throat> well, you think back, I mean, I don't know who they were talking to in those meetings, but um, if you think to the people, um, and, and this is one of the reasons why I think this is a young person's business, but, you know, 
40 years ago, it wouldn't have been uncommon to have people come into your office and pitch an idea um, to raise the first few million dollars to go buy servers and disks and, right. you know, and software licenses, to go build something and then come back and show you something, right? Look how far we've come from that. Mm -hmm. Where today, if you walk in and you don't have something wiggling, you know, you can't show a prototype or right. something, then you're just not resourceful enough as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, in a way, engineers have, have put themselves out of a job by building so much abstraction and giving so much power to people who are not engineers and not coders um, to deeply affect, you know, what a, what a product does. That, that shifts, you know, the kind of um, one of the value points of the business, certainly, to the people who will, f you know, figure out how to do that and what it'll look like and how it'll flow, what it'll, what it'll feel like. So that's why designers, you know, matter and that's why um, designing that experience uh, has been such a, you know, the decisions that they made in the way they designed that experience have had such an impact on the success of that, uh, of that offering. It's really opened it um, up to much yeah, broader. And, and, I, and, I, and yeah. I don't think it's, that's the only company that, that, where that's the case. Um, but, you know, I think if you don't see that today as an investor, you're, uh, you're not going to make a lot of great investments. Yeah. I feel like those, those sorts of things go in cycles too, right? Like, I was born in 74, so I started... Uh, you know, my design career on the early web. I don't remember like shrink wrap software. I never, never worked on that stuff. But, um, you know, when the web first became popular, uh, we didn't even have cascading style sheets at all, right? All we had was HTML. So a designer didn't have a whole lot of power, right? It was really, it was the webmaster at the time, right? Like that was who was the, the great builder of the, of the websites. Um, and that tended to be a very engineering, you know, centric job. And then as, you know, inline styles became more popular and table-based design became more popular, which you and I have done way too much of. Way too much. Um, hopefully nobody in this room has. Uh, then we sort of like found ourselves with a little bit more power and a little bit more influence. And then when cascading style sheets became popular, even more influence, right? And so we reached kind of this point, I think, in the, let's say, by the, the early aughts. Is that what you call it? The aughts? I'm sure. The 2000s. Yeah. Where, we, where designers were able to create entire experiences on their own, um, oftentimes without engineers in the room. Not that that's a good thing. But we had all the tools at our disposal to create amazing experiences just, you know, on our own, on our own machines, essentially. Um, so that was like a peak, right? And then I think we kind of went down a little bit with the advent, of, the advent of mobile design, right? Because no designer knew Objective-C uh, when the iPhone came out. Uh, most designers these days still don't know Objective-C or Swift or Java. Uh, so it kind of became this more, this, this more integrated development process with designers and engineers working hand in hand. Uh, together to create these sorts of experiences. And now we're finding again, like these prototyping tools are getting so good that we can get pretty far uh, creating a, a, a delightful experience without really touching native code. Um, so it's just interesting to see like, you know, every few years we kind of go up and down the cycle of, of uh, you know, how, how much influence and power and ability as a designer you have to create great experiences uh, on your own. Um, I should say that I think you know, creating great ex experiences is really a team sport. Uh, ideally, you've got a PM, designer, engineer, researcher all involved from day one. That's kind of how we think of things at Twitter, um, but that's not, that's not for everyone. So I just right. think it's interesting to see the cycles that we go through. It's a great perspective. Um, David, uh, creating Typeform, um, two design co-founders, is that, is that right? right? Yeah. Tell us about your experience there. Uh, well, we weren't business people, we were just product people. Um, Myself and my co-founder had our own creative agencies and we basically went into this without any business sense at all, but we had a sense of product and we had a sense of empathizing with users. So we applied that to forms and came at it, came at it from a totally different perspective. And I think people kind of connected with that quite well. So your product, um, uh, and I don't mean to minimize it or sure, sure. in any way, but I think it's a beautifully designed, very intuitive and usable uh, mm. version of SurveyMonkey, really, right? The thing that everybody, <laughs> well, so I don't mean to minimize it, but that would be a touch point that everybody uh -huh. has been like, this is the leader in the industry uh -huh. of you know, online forms and, yeah. and things like that. Um, you took a totally different approach to a relatively crowded and, and somewhat sort of complete market. Um, well, we, Coming we, from a design we had no pressure. We, we, we were kind of working in our own vacuum. We didn't have investors at the time. We didn't have 
real employees because we were just using resources from our own company. So we could just go head on, mm -hmm. just trying different things. And we just had one mission is to try and make forms as awesome as possible. And that was it. Um, so then you, um, as Neil was saying, sort of came to uh, a point where you decided to take investment um, uh -huh. with a fully functioning product at that point. Sure. Well, th that was a bit later. I mean, we, we went through a couple of rounds of investments before that, before yeah. Neil, Neil came in. But yeah. So that uh, so essentially, we're able to sort of almost bootstrap, sort of uh, get started. Yeah, the, we actually spent something. around a year and a half just playing around with the product before we even released it, because we had no economic pressures because we had our own design studios. So we were able to just in our spare time or on downtime from projects, just work on 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 Typeform. So do you find yourself now in a position as a designer managing engineers? Uh, well, luckily, I, <laughs> I have someone to do that, but I'm, but I'm, still, I'm managing designers. I mean, we have a very small design team at, at Typeform, and I'm super involved, obviously. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, from a designer point, managing engineers is, is for a, an engineer manager, not for, for a designer to do. Although there is... You know, a lot of a lot of collaboration between the two all the time. I think engineering and design in the future are going to be melting into one. You see already designers that are prototyping using Framer.js and so forth. So, I, I and I actually would add to that that I think it's really important for a designer to understand what he's designing for. You can't just design in a vacuum to make things pretty. You have to actually understand the technology that you're, that you're designing for. Fundamentally, yeah, yeah. that's great. Uh, Mike, I want to get back to what you were talking about with that sort of waxing and waning of, mm -hmm. of uh, relative power that designers have. Um, at, at bigger companies now, we have this idea of, of designers getting a seat at the table yeah. uh, that perhaps in the past was much more elusive. That certainly mm -hmm. sort of the trajectory of my own career was to start my own companies since it was so hard to get the kind of influence and authority I wanted to have mm -hmm. over the product at the places that I had worked before. Um, what do you think, what's this sort of chief product officer compared to CTO, and, um, and how have you seen that playing out, say, at Twitter, for example? Well, I mean, I would just say if you're a designer in this room and you're thinking about joining a company, you should join a company that either has already given design a seat at the table or is interested in, or is interested in bringing you in in order to give design a seat at the table. Um, I think, as you said, it's a fairly recent phenomenon for like design executives to sit kind of shoulder to shoulder with CEOs and uh, VPs of engineering and VPs of product and all that. Um, but it's really important for us, at least, to think of product design, engineering, and research all as equal kind of uh, legs of a stool. Um, we have all four of those disciplines involved in every single product that we, that we build from start to finish. So there's no PM going into a corner uh, for a week or two, writing a writing a, a roadmap for the rest of the team to execute. Um, there's no engineer going home and rewriting a service that is that 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 nobody that nobody has uh, you know approved and seen before and launching it without any sort of design oversight. There's no designer even uh, you know uh, 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 spending two or three weeks in a dark room working on mockups and then springing them uh, on the rest of the team. Uh, we really believe in a collaborative design process, and that goes all the way from the top of the company to the bottom of the company. Um, so. I, I mean, I look at everybody who's involved in product development as co-designers of cu the customer's experience. Um, it may be the PM's job to kind of frame the problem that you, that you want to solve and figure out how you're going to measure success. Um, it's probably the designer's job to lead, to, to lead the exploratory process of prototyping and, and uh, divergent thought in terms of you know, how many different ways can we solve this problem. Uh, it's the lead engineer's job to make sure it gets built so, you know, solidly and, and, and in a way that will scale. Uh, and, you know, and it's the researcher's job to make sure that we, are, that we, that we fully understand the problem that we want to solve before we, we, we set out to solve it. So um, does it take a little bit longer than like a straight dictatorship? Uh, sure. But straight dictatorships rarely, rarely ever work. Um, Ed Catmull, who is speaking, I think, at the very end of this conference, maybe at the end of the day Thursday, fantastic speaker. I could listen to the guy speak for days and days. Um, you should totally go see him. Um, from Pixar, From right? Pixar, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's got a great book called Creativity, Inc., uh, which everybody should read. And in it, there's a great quote that says, involve people in your problems, not just your solutions. And that really kind of sums it up to me. Um, I think 
you know, by, in, by involving everybody's energy at the beginning, at the middle, and the end of the process, you get everybody's best creative energy on the problem that you're trying to solve. And it's, it's sorry, I think it's sad. It's not just designers who can add design right. to the design process. Right. Because design isn't always just about, you know, pushing pixels or, or, or drawing. It's also about, you know, being involved in a process, even like designing a process for yeah. how a person gets onboarded into the company, Absolutely. it involves yeah. design. So it's not, it's not always about designers. Yeah. It's, uh, for me, a designer is a person that can em empathize yep. with a user. So I think we're all capable of doing that, not just you know, people that are labeled as, as designers. We think of ourselves as professional empathy machines. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, certainly the uh, perspective that um, I tried to take when we were building Typekit, which mm -hmm. was that we would use similar sorts of uh, method, uh, empathy values and things, not just for the product, but uh, even extending into our business development relationships. How many times have you seen partnerships and companies just go terribly wrong because nobody has considered the user experience of yep. these two things coming together? Yep. We did that kind of stuff, our sales process, even our terms of service, all of those things uh, as part of ultimately the product experience that people would have. So yeah, that's good. Do you have a... Oh, I thought you were trying to comment on that. No, I, I, you know, I think, I mean, it's hard to add anything to, to what you said. I think you've summed up this stuff really well. Um, but there are people in organizations who don't have empathy. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I know a lot of engineers who have zero empathy, um, almost clinically no empathy. But that's, <laughs> but that's fine because they don't really need empathy to be great coders, yeah, right? It, it does or help, to be great yeah. architects. Sure, it helps, but actually it's a distraction. Yeah. You know, I don't care. It's not, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I mean, so there are reasons why you guys ended up as designers and not as, you know, back-end database architect. I mean, maybe, yeah. you know, you could do both. I mean, there's, there's, there, there are different types of empathy, though, right? Like, I, I kind of agree with you. Like, if you are, you know, uh, optimizing, you know, tweet fan out algorithms to make sure that one tweet can go, you know, to a billion places at once, um, you know, you should probably just be laser focused on that yep. uh, to make sure that that, that actually happens. Um, so that's like, you know, user facing empathy. But I think everybody uh, it could benefit from having empathy at least towards their own team members, right? And so you may, your job may not, as an engineer, may not be like writing something that goes directly in front of a user, but you have to work with people on your team and you have to work with sure. other people in the company. And, and, and you're, I think you're right. Like there are people who are, who are clinically empathyless. Um, but but I, I, at the same time, I think it's it's possible, and it's actually our responsibility uh, to teach empathy at every endpoint we possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a framing mechanism, really. Even in the example that you gave, right, of um, performance, mm -hmm. right, that um, having a performant app, uh, something that is is going to respond very quickly. It's part of the user experience. Yeah. So even that engineer that's got heads down is not just writing code for the purity of the algorithm, right. but they're affecting the user experience. Right. Um, and I think that from a leadership perspective, that's a way of framing a set of values that we have for the work that we do. Yep. So um, Neil, you said earlier you've seen some companies where that just didn't exist. They didn't have not just design and the DNA, but maybe not a strong product sense. And you, you mentioned quickly that it's really hard to almost impossible to overcome. Have you, yeah. have you seen, so I, I would imagine there's designers in the audience that are like, oh my God, not the, my company is just, I can't. Is it something that can happen from the bottom up or do you think it really has to be a value top down? Uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it's not really a question of top down versus bottom up. I mean, in a small company, you know, there are sure. 10 people. Um, if you're so hierarchical that, you know, that somebody uh, kind of at the low end of that hierarchy can't be heard. You have, you have other issues. But, so it's not so much whether it's the, the CEO or the, the first, you know, the first CTO or design product person at the company. It's more, um, do they think this is important? You know, it's how, uh, how do they come to this problem? Why, why is this idea in their heads? You know, in, in, in David and Robert's case, it was clear, you know, they ran into this problem and they were just tired. They just said, we can't fill out another bloody form. You know, we're gonna, there's gotta be a better way of doing this. And, and they drew on their own capabilities to address that problem. You know, there are lots of companies out there that are um, born from a spreadsheet, you know, where you'll get people together. Um, I won't say, call them MBAs, but let's call them MBAs, even though I'm an MBA, so <laughs> um, a little self-deprecation. But you know they'll do a spreadsheet of like this business model, this business model, this geography, 
you know, this, this market segment, you know, what hasn't been done? Oh, this sounds pretty good. Let's go do this. You know, like there are companies that are designed that way, that, that, that are born that way. And have you seen those companies being successful? No, no, no. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, look at Rocket. I mean, Rocket Internet, right? Yeah. And by the way, I have a lot of respect for what they do. But, but they kind of take that approach. I mean, they kind of look at the world and say, you know, let's do online shoes in Thailand. Mm -hmm. You know, a big market. Boom, let's put a team together. Um, yeah, they've been successful. You can, but that's a totally different, I mean, that's not what we're into. Um, I doubt it's what you're into. I doubt they'd be able to hire you to one of those companies, right? But they can hire people and they can raise money and they can, you know, find customers. It's, it's just a different approach. Yeah. Uh, but there are not many of those. I mean, I give true. those as an example. That's true. Let's no. shift gears a little bit. Um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, designers here in the audience that are just starting in their careers. Mike, you hire designers all the time, mm -hmm. lots and lots of them. Um, uh, I would imagine all, of all levels of experience, but talk about sort of the designers. They're all great. They're all great, that's yeah. right. Um, but talk about the designers that are entering the workforce and what you see there and how technical are they? Yeah. How, like what's their, you know, what yeah. do they bring into the table? Yeah, well we, like many um, fast moving companies, I guess, don't really hire s too many specialists on our team. We don't hire too many like peer visual designers. We don't hire too many like, you know, like icon designers, wire framers. Um, these specialists that, that I think were a lot more common, let's say 10 years ago or so, and one of the reasons is like when I when I have a problem that I want that I you know that I want solved, I'd like to be able to give you know ideally one designer um, domain over solving that entire problem. So that problem may take six months to solve, it may take a month to solve, who knows? But I just the process of kind of like oh we've got this one person who like will do the conceptual work and then they can pass it off to this other person who can do the wireframes and then they can pass it off to this other person who can do the the, the high fidelity mockups and then the, you know like it's just too it's there's too much communication overhead associated with that and so we like to hire well-rounded um, hybrid designers um, so they don't designers. yeah product designers exactly we we actually used to call them experienced designers I actually still like that term better than product design we kind of changed our job descriptions to product design just because it kind of matches what everybody else you know yeah. is is doing um, so it's a more familiar term to people but I really do think of all of our designers and researchers as experienced designers who are charged with solving a problem and creating a, creating an experience beginning to end and so you know Andre talked this morning about uh, code. Uh, you know, should you code as a designer? I kind of agree with them. Like, yes, you should have some level of code, um, coding proficiencies. But that 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 proficiency might stop at like high fidelity prototyping. It might stop at JavaScript. And I think you know, you think he agrees uh, uh, with that sentiment. But like, it's not a requirement that you code to work at Twitter. But it is a requirement that you're able to take an entire uh, problem and work with an engineering team and a product and a, and a product team to solve it more or less on your own or with the help of of maybe one or two other designers. Um, so the people that we that we see coming out of school these days are pretty well rounded. Um, I think it's it's hard to kind of pick a particular micro skill within design right now to really go deep on because things change so quickly, right? Like if you spent all of your time preparing yourself to design on the web, um, and then the iPhone you know came along, like you're kind of screwed, right? Um, if you spent all your time learning how to design apps for the iPhone and didn't pay any attention to Android at all because you live in the US and, and people didn't start using Android until the rest of the world did, um, you're, you might be similarly screwed, right? So uh, I think well-roundedness is, is, is something that we really look for. Um, we were talking a little bit uh, before, beforehand over there um, about how, you know, how to evaluate designers. And like, I don't look at resumes at all. I do not care what is on your resume. I do not care what degree you have. I don't care where you went to school. I don't care what your GPA is. I have, I have seen people with master's degrees in design from Stanford who I wouldn't even hire as interns. Um, and I have seen people with not even high school educations who are brilliant at what they do. Um, all I care about is you know, how, good is your how good is your stuff? Are you able to articulate the problem that you were trying to solve, show the process that you went through, and then show, the, show a really nice solution to, to the problem, and how easy do I think you are to work with. Um, and that's really all that matters. Uh, so not saying don't go to design school, I'm not saying don't go to college, uh, I'm just saying don't think that that's gonna be your key to getting a great job in design. The key to getting a great job in design is, is, is being a great designer and being a great coworker. David, how does that map to your experience? Yeah. First building an agency and then building a product company. Uh, when, when we get applications for design, 
usually comes to me and I don't look at the, the, the CV. I just, yeah. I just look at the portfolio and if it, if it feels good, then, then I look in closer. But yep. I, I, I won't look at a CV yeah, okay. um, firsthand. So let me ask you um, a little bit about geography. Uh, Silicon Valley has traditionally been considered the sort of center of technology industry and things like that, but has no culture or history as a design center at all. Uh, whereas places like New York or London or, in your case, Barcelona is where you're uh, building your company, yep. much more of a tradition. Um, do you think that's an opportunity now to shift some of the center of where things are happening and being built? Yeah, I mean, Barcelona is, is quite an inspiring city, so it draws, it attracts people that are creative. So it's a kind of good hotbed for, for, for design to come out, and it has done in terms of architecture you see, in terms of artists. I don't think there's quite yet like a kind of culture of, of, of product design yet. You see a lot of graphic designers coming out of Barcelona, but not so much product designers. And right. I, th I think that's just because there aren't that many products coming out of Spain. There's a lot of kind of vertical websites and you know, big listings and so forth, but uh, we haven't come across that many. In, What's in the entrepreneurial environment like in Spain it's, and Barcelona? It's good, it's vibrant. It's, it's still pretty small, but it's, it's, it's growing quite fast. And Barcelona, like I say, is a great place to attract talent as well. People really love the city. You know, when you travel around the world and you say you're from Barcelona, people's eyes always kind of open up saying they, they love Barcelona, so. So even from a recruiting point of view. Yeah, no, we've, helpful, we've, yeah. We, you know, we've managed to bring people over from San Francisco to, to Barcelona just because of the city. Nice, what's yeah. your experience more broadly across Europe? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's actually a really interesting study that recently came out <clears throat> by Nesta, which is uh, a UK uh, not-for-profit not research institute. And they, they kind of looked at cities as centers of innovation. You know, they didn't stop looking at countries, they looked at cities, because actually this stuff happens in cities. It doesn't happen in the countryside. And they came up with criteria to evaluate whether a city would be a good place for entrepreneurship and, and innovation. And it, it was really actually quite... Uh, illuminating, um, because you have all these cities that you know brag about great quality of life and great this and great museums. And at the end of the day, you know if you can't get across the city or there or you can't, you know, do grocery shopping on a Sunday evening, you're not going to get young people there. You're not going to get startups. Um, but actually, Barcelona came in at second, I think, on this I thing. It was fourth. Or fourth. It was like it did really well. Yeah. It's top top five. Um, and I think that that's. Uh, and the good news is that there were several European cities on that list. You know, London was there, um, uh, Barcelona, uh, Berlin, I can't remember where they ranked, but they ranked highly. Um, so uh, New York did well, San Francisco did well, obviously. But you're getting uh, more and more cities internationally are figuring this out. Our understanding, you know, they can't replicate Silicon Valley. It's an unusual thing. But you don't have to replicate Silicon Valley. You know, you can build great companies in, uh, you know, in, in Helsinki, in, in Barcelona, in Berlin, in Amsterdam, in Dublin. Um, if you get the kind of growing conditions right, you can attract young people and they'll, they'll do interesting things and they'll attract their friends and you'll get critical mass. Inspiring, especially here, uh, speaking in Dublin, which is another, uh, I think, fantastic place yeah. to start companies and, and build them. Uh, Neil, David, Mike, thanks so much. It's very interesting. Um, thank and thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.